Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our monthly IBA webinar. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Fiona Edwards-Murphy and Dr. Podrick Whelan from APIS Protect. APIS Protect brings the power of advanced sensors and machine learning technology into the hive to deliver a 24-7 early warning system so beekeepers can give at-risk hives immediate attention and improve uh, their bee health. APIS Protect was founded by Dr. Fiona Edwards-Murphy and Dr. Podrick Whelan in 2017. Since then, they have been testing prototypes around the world and have launched two products into the market into the past, in the past six months. Combining the sensor data on hive conditions, health and activity levels with its proprietary big data and machine learning techniques, APRIS Protect gives beekeepers actionable insights and alerts to help prevent losses and increase colony productivity. Contributing 153 billion euros worth of pollination to the agri-food industry annually, honeybees play an essential role in global food production. In the US, APRIS Protect has a commercial product for large commercial beekeepers using artificial intelligence and machine learning. APRIS Protect has launched its hobbyist product in Ireland over the past few months, and they're here, here today to tell us all about the story so far and how this technology can help you with your beekeeping and ensure you spend your time at the hives that need your, your attention the most. Now, we're going to join um, both our doctors now in one second, but just a very quick housekeeping um, requirement. There's probably going to be a good few questions for this webinar, so we would, uh, I would ask you to put your questions in the chat and we will uh, get through them one by one at the end if that's okay. So we're going to hand over to Dr. Fiona right now and uh, thank you very much Fiona for joining us. Great, thanks so much Stephen. Um, hi everybody, thanks so much for uh, uh, having us uh, today to um, present to you. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen here where I have my slides. Um, so usually what we like to do is we'll, we'll spend about maybe 20 minutes on our presentation and then we'll get to questions because usually <laughs> there's a good few questions and it's good to kind of focus on, on what you want to talk about and, and have a good chat. Um, so again, thanks very much for having us today. Uh, so uh, we're the, the co-founders of APIS Protect, um, myself and Podrig. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder, uh, but my original role in the team is uh, as the engineer. So I'll give a bit of an introduction to myself and Podrick can give an introduction to him himself. Uh, so my own background is in electrical and electronic engineering. Uh, so I uh, grew up in North Cork in Canturk for anyone who <laughs> knows North Cork, uh, surrounded by uh, farming and uh, a bit of beekeeping, though I certainly didn't have a, a huge amount of experience in beekeeping uh, before. Uh, so I went to UCC where I studied electrical and electronic engineering. I got involved with the um, a research group there, uh, working on uh, sensor technology applications uh, at that stage back in uh, you know, 2010, 2011. Uh, it was called Wireless Sensor Networks. Today it's called the Internet of Things and it's had a, a whole list of names in between. So <laughs> I just like to call what I do sensor technologies. Um, so really, really fell in love with, uh, with that space and the, the area that, or the reason why I found it really, really interesting was uh, because I, I got to use sensor technologies, got to use the things I was learning about in, in engineering uh, to impact the real world. So I worked on a variety of different projects, things like um, human health monitoring and um, education, improving educational experiences and also structural health monitoring. So health and safety in um, on sites in, in uh, Italy. Uh, so, uh, worked on a variety of different applications, fell in love with that space. And in 2012, uh, I was uh, interested in starting a PhD just as I was finishing my undergrad. And um, I started to learn about beekeeping at that stage, started to hear about, um, like I think a lot of people did at that time, because there was also a lot of headlines and news articles about it, about the problems that beekeepers were facing, uh, in particular in the US with colony collapse disorder, um, and started learning about the problems that that bees were facing around the globe and that one of the biggest problems that was being faced is that there's so many problems happening simultaneously that beekeeping has become very difficult purely because you're trying to tackle a lot of problems at once and uh, you know fight on a lot of different fronts so between diseases pests uh, you know normal high problems like starvation and cleanlessness as well as you know the changing uh, environment in which people are trying to keep bees um, and I was like oh that's a perfect application for sensor technologies. Uh, so I started my PhD, uh, co-supervised by Podrick, <laughs> and uh, spent four years working on my PhD, uh, just exploring sensor technologies for beehives, and uh, realized over the, the course of that, that, that PhD that there was actually 
a huge potential here to bring this technology to the real world of beekeeping. So take it out of academia, take it out of beekeeping research and bring it to uh, real world beekeepers, uh, both small and large scale beekeepers. Uh, so that's the reason why I, I co-founded Apis Protect in 2017. Uh, what I saw was there was a couple of technologies on the market at that stage, but they weren't um, you know, uh, really well engineered devices that were suitable to be scaled up and sent out into the real world of beekeeping. They weren't uh, scalable in the way that they're, um, they were collecting data and they also weren't particularly robust for um, the real world of beekeeping where you've got to be able to take off your roof, throw it on the ground and stack your supers on top. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do when I set out in 2017. Uh, so I'll let Padraig <laughs> uh, give his own background. You're muted, Padraig. So I probably know uh, quite a few of you in the IBA. Um, I'll see your faces later on. So um, as Fiona said, I was uh, one of her PhD supervisors, the, the B-man involved in it. And uh, so I have a background, um, 21 years teaching in UCC. And before that, I'd worked on the Galapagos Islands for five years and I'd worked in the Amazon rainforest for just under a year and a half. Um, so when I was in UCC, at one stage, uh, bees, a swarm flew into the roof of my house. And I, I thought that was a sign. And I said, that might be an interesting hobby. So I, I got one hive and I went to Gormanston in 2004. Um, so I learned my beekeeping there. And uh, I then sort of started building up the number of hives. And once students heard that I had bees and there was all these problems with bees, more and more of them wanted to do projects. So they started undergraduates projects, then masters projects and things like drone congregation areas. Um, and then, you know, Fiona um, came and said, you know, I want to do a PhD. I had another student as well, Maria, um, who also uh, wanted to do a PhD. And um, she, we linked up with the uh, USDA to do that one. And um, so eventually I was coming up to when UCC was kind of asking potential retirees, can you please get out because you're coming up to 65 years of age? Uh, can you go early? So Fiona said, I need a beekeeper. And I thought, well, I love doing beekeeping um, and uh, more time with bees. So I said, yes, I'll become the beekeeper in Apis Protect. And that's where I've been. And you know, my, my background has been useful in terms of the, the overall biology and conservation that I used to teach in terms of the kind of habitats across the world, the different kinds of climatic conditions in which bees occur. Um, also because I'd worked in South America, I've got fluent Spanish and that becomes very useful when you're working in the United States because a lot of the migrant labor that comes up from Central America tends to be Spanish speaking um, with limited English in many cases. So I, I kind of, when I'm in the States, I'm working bilingually most of the time. So um, that's me. So I've got a couple of slides here on uh, what we've been up to for the last few years since 2017. Uh, so like I mentioned in, in 2017, what, what we saw was that beekeepers were, were really struggling uh, to be able to manage poor colony condition. And, you know, really the biggest struggle was that there were so many different causes of poor colony condition, things like uh, diseases, pests, uh, you know, general hive problems, um, you know, even just weather or animal damage as well. Um, and that it's very difficult and expensive, you know, when you're talking about your own time or even uh, in the case of, um, you know, large scale beekeepers, uh, they're the labor that they actually hire in. It's um, very expensive. I mean, like beekeeping is a skill. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a skill that takes time to learn. It's very difficult to scale up your enabler labor and to scale up your beekeeping to be able to provide um, the kind of beekeeping that we saw a demand for in the US or even just for honey production. Um, and the other thing that, that we saw was that there hadn't been a huge amount of translation of uh, the kind of scientific papers and stuff like that that we were seeing into the real world of beekeeping, not an awful lot of the, the research and even the kind of sensor research that I was doing during my PhD. They're on very controlled environments, they're on beehives inside in labs, they're on, um, you know, observation beehives. What we wanted was a technology that could go out in the real world and have an actual impact on the beehives uh, that, that, you know, make up the majority of the beehive population. Um, we also got the opportunity um, to, to learn a bit more about the, uh, in particular, the, the U.S. beekeeping industry, uh, so the pollination industry, uh, which is a, a really interesting uh, phenomenon, so basically driven by uh, the almond industry. So um, in California, they produce about 80% of the almonds that, that are produced globally. Um, they produce those in 1.3 million acres of land in California, which isn't actually a huge amount of California. I think it's about five counties. And um, in order for uh, the 
these are so in order for those almond trees in the orchards to be pollinated to produce almonds they require honeybee pollination and honeybee specifically uh, pollination so the way that they achieve that is they put two beehives in every acre they rent out two beehives for every acre uh, from beekeepers and place them um, in their orchards for the month of february uh, so what that means is uh, the almond industry demands every single February that they need uh, you know, 2.6 million beehives. And there's actually only 2 million beehives in the commercial beekeeping industry in the US. Uh, so you can see there, there's already a shortfall of half a million beehives. Uh, so there's this insane demand for beehives every single um, February. Uh, so those bee beekeepers are able to demand a premium for access to their beehives at that time. So basically, um, it's gone to the point now where the almond industry will pay beekeepers $200 per hive just to hold on to their beehives for the month of February. So at this point, beekeepers now make more money from pollination services than they do from honey in, in the majority of places in the U.S. Um, there's also other crops, things like uh, blueberries, cranberries, apples, uh, even a bit of uh, cucumbers and watermelons. So they've got the, the almond pollination, which is where they make an awful lot of money, and then they make maybe $60 or $70 on some other crop, um, you know, canola oil, things like that. Um, so we saw that um, these beekeepers are trying to scale up their operations to meet the demand from these almond farms. So an almond farm would be looking for, you know, several thousand beehives at one time, and traditional beekeeping really struggles uh, to be able to maximize their hive strength meet that. Um, so uh, we were, what we wanted to do was create a technology to help, um, you know, scale up traditional beekeeping, essentially. So the solution that we envisioned uh, was a sensor device that would go inside the beehives, uh, collect sensor data, and then um, send that data back to our servers. Um, and then when it gets onto those servers, we apply a technology called machine learning, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. But basically that machine learning translates raw sensor data into useful um, information about the beehive. And then that we'd be able to send that information back to the beekeepers through a website or through an app or in a really digestible way so that they can actually get very, very quickly useful information about their beehives as opposed to data about their beehives. Um, so uh, we had several revisions of our technology in the field. And um, this is the device that we ended up producing. Podrick has one there, that's the correct color. Um, it is not gray. I just have one of the older boxes where we're trying out different colors. Um, so we've got this device, we've got four sensors on board there, temperature, humidity, uh, we've got a microphone, and we've also got an accelerometer, which measures movement. And those are the four sensors that we identified that were most valuable, that could provide the most information about the beehives. Um, and then we uh, trained up our machine learning algorithms. And machine learning, again, just like Internet of Things, I feel like machine learning is a big scary name for what is uh, really quite a straightforward technology. So the Internet of Things is just putting sensors into the real world to collect useful information. And machine learning is uh, using computers uh, to learn about data from the real world. Uh, so what we did was we collected a huge number of examples of what our sensors, uh, the data that our sensors collect from healthy beehives, from unhealthy beehives, from uh, beehives that are growing, beehives that are shrinking, beehives that are queenless. And we show uh, an algorithm, we train up an algorithm, we give it all of these examples, and it learns uh, from looking at that data and from looking at that data with the context of, oh, this is a healthy beehive, this is an unhealthy beehive. It learns what the patterns in that data look like in each of these cases. And it's able to watch new data as it comes in. And it can say, oh, I recognize this pattern. And I recognize this pattern from a time that I saw a hive that was growing. So I'm going to say, I, I, I'm going to guess right now that this beehive is growing. And it can get actually very, very accurate, much more accurate than a human can at understanding what that data means, uh, because it's able to do it millions of times a second. And it's able to do it 24 hours a day. And machine learning is a uh, really important technology. It's how uh, Netflix knows what kind of movies you like. It's how uh, Google's self-driving cars are trained. So what they do is they collect pictures from the real world. They collect uh, pictures of cars, pictures of humans, pictures of traffic lights. They show those pictures to the machine learning algorithm and eventually the car is driving down the road with that computer on its brain and it's able to say, that's a traffic light, that's a human, that's a traffic light I should stop or that's a green traffic light so I can go, that's a human, I shouldn't drive over them. So it's a really important technology and we're using it to help identify um, uh, behaviors and conditions within beehives. Uh, so the first thing that we set out to do was to collect <laughs> the database to build that machine learning and also get a bit of real world experience uh, about putting technologies into beehives. So I had a, a small bit of real world experience for my PhD, but we wanted to scale it up very quickly. 
Um, so we were lucky enough, we managed to raise a seed round for our company in 2018, uh, so one and a half million euro to help us uh, do this work. And um, what we did was we rolled out 400 sensors um, to 20 different locations across three continents. Uh, so our hives were in uh, the USA, Ireland, the UK and South Africa. And um, we spent 24 months uh, monitoring those beehives, uh, collecting inspection data about those beehives. So a really important thing for machine learning is being able to provide the, a really accurate human understanding to match the sensor data. So we get the sensor data and we're, we need a very objective, uh, well-qualified beekeeper to say that is a healthy beehive or that is a shrinking beehive. You know, the, the quality of both sets of data has to be as high as possible. Um, so that meant that Podrick and Richard, one of our data scientists, got to spend a, a lot of time in some very nice locations uh, keeping bees. And uh, well, I got to do a couple of those trips too, but I'm less useful on the inspection <laughs> site. Um, so I've got some nice pictures here of some of the sites that we worked in. Um, so first of all, here we've got um, a location in South Africa. So uh, we had some beehives in a wildlife reserve in the northern part of South Africa. Uh, this picture here is from a commercial beehive operation in California. So one of those kind of operations I mentioned earlier that um, rent out their beehives to almond farmers. Um, there is another uh, location here that's in the desert in Arizona. So uh, a slightly different kind of desert. <laughs> and then here is uh, a honey operation that we worked with in uh, the Peak District in the UK. So you can see here we got data. Well, one of our objectives was to get data from a variety of different locations to try and understand uh, beehives in these like extreme locations uh, where they are kept so very very cold we had beehives in you know in the midwest in the u.s in minnesota that would have been under you know several feet of snow in the middle of winter we had like that beehives in the desert where they were more worried about letting the heat in than <laughs> keeping the heat in um and then like that uh, different bee subspecies such as you know um, here in, in ireland and the uk we've got our own uh, subspecies in south africa it's a completely different is it a species or subspecies project Two different subspecies. The, the, the two different subspecies. Two different subspecies. Yeah. Okay. And then in the US, where they have pretty much a hybrid of a variety everything. of different kinds of bees. Yeah, bit of everything. And then, you know, using uh, the experience of putting sensors out into the real world over um, three years, uh, we developed this device. Um, so uh, we put an awful lot of our learning into that, so learning about how narrow we need the, the, the device to be, so it's 1.5 centimetres or three-fifths of an inch thick. Uh, so one thing that we learned was that a, a lot of commercial operations use a very, very small hives, so their hives are as, as, as compact as possible, so there's very, very little space around the outside of the bees, uh, so the device needed to be very, very slim to be able to fit in the roof space in, in their hives. So you can see here installed in a, this is called a, a commercial beehive uh, in the U.S., so you can see it's basically just a plank of wood that sits on top of the, <laughs> the, the box of bees. Um, we also learned that it needs to have a really good battery life. Um, so we initially started with um, rechargeable uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, then we realized after a little while, what about if there's a disease outbreak and somebody wants to destroy these devices or destroy the hives that they're in? Or if somebody wants to disinfect their devices for some reason um, and they want to be able to dip it into a bucket of bleach, uh, a lithium battery, a rechargeable battery is very, very dangerous if it, it gets heated or if it gets wet. Um, so <laughs> we very quickly switched over to disposable batteries, which are a lot safer in both of those conditions. And um, so that was another piece of learning. Um, and as well, we've got a battery lifespan of, of uh, two years on a, a disposable battery. So it's able to, to last an extended period of time while still using those disposable batteries. We realized it needed to be able to be installed in the beehive very, very quickly. Uh, so it's very, very straightforward. It's just two screws, one on either end. Uh, so it can be installed in two screws and put in a set of batteries. We say less than two minutes. I, you know, Practically, that doesn't really take two minutes, but <laughs> just in case someone's um, very, very slow with their screwdriver or something. And uh, it's completely self-installed by the beekeeper, doesn't require any technical expertise to install. So we manage things like the SIM cards and the, you know, the data, uh, extracting the data from the device is all handled uh, by our, our engineering team. So what we wanted to do was completely um, make this technology never have to never impact the actual keeping beekeeping activities that need to go on. So like that, it needs to be robust enough to throw it on the ground. Uh, it needs to be able to uh, keep working, uh, so it's propolis resistant as well, and uh, that's often a question we get, how do you solve for propolis? That was a, a long, long engineering process. 
Um, so yeah, basically it's robust enough to live in the real world of beekeeping, which was one of the things I set out to do from day one. And uh, what we see at uh, the key benefits that our beekeepers who we've worked with have found from uh, using the device in their operations is uh, the data that we provide to the beekeepers that helps them manage their time and resources more effectively because they know what's going on in their beehives. They're able to check on their beehives remotely because that data is coming back uh, all around the clock. They're able to say, you know, just open up your open up your web open up your laptop or open up your phone and look at that data and see how the bees are getting on. Uh, evaluate the condition of the colony so understand more about what's going on inside the colonies, what is it doing uh, at different times of the day, and then identify weak colonies for intervention. And ultimately what that leads to is improved apiary management, uh, increased product production, uh, fewer losses, so you're able to intervene on problems uh, earlier, and uh, peace of mind. So uh, we launched, we're, we're very happy to say we've launched two different products. So we've launched uh, our, uh, last December, we launched our US commercial product. So we're uh, going, uh, we're selling into large beekeeping operations in the US. So those will be commercially skilled, you know, exactly those guys who are renting out their hives to the uh, pollination industry, but also doing honey production or, or a mix of both. Um, and then we also have our hobbyist technology, which is available in Ireland, which Stephen mentioned earlier. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of the, <laughs> the title hobbyist uh, for our Irish technology, because there's a kind of a slight implication there that those beekeepers aren't as serious as the commercial beekeepers we work with. That's certainly not our opinion. Beekeeping in Ireland, it's, a, you know, it's a, an area where you need to be quite skilled in, in beekeeping. So often uh, we find our Irish beekeepers are uh, just as skilled as, as the large scale beekeepers we work with in the US. Uh, so the hobbyist word there really just refers to, you know, not thousands of beehives, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, so uh, Podrick is gonna take you through a little bit more about how our, our product in Ireland works. Yeah, so the, um, as, as Fiona was saying, um, this, this monitor, if you like, monitors your hive. And the way, the way I like to think about it is, you know, I talk to people about it. it's being a bit like a baby monitor inside in a beehive, um, you know, when it gives you peace of mind or, um, you know, you, you, you get to know what's going on. So here on this table, if you look at it here, um, in terms of managing your time and resources, you know, if I've got hives out in my garden and, um, you know, I know that if I'm going to go through all 20 hives, it's going to take me the best part of Sunday afternoon to do it. On the other hand, if I look up the, the laptop, and I can see that actually there's only two hives that kind of are out of line compared to all the other hives or there's some trend in the, the information that suggests I need to take a look at them. Well, then I'd only look at those two hives. And so, for example, um, I've had a hive recently and I mean, I kind of locked down my hives in October and didn't go near the frames until about a couple of weeks ago. But there was one of the hives had, um, you know, was tended to be kind of cold compared to the other ones in terms of the temperature readings. So I, I decided I'd open that one up and it, it turns out the colony was particularly weak. Um, there was an awful lot of empty space inside in the hive uh, for the number of bees that were in there. So I put in some insulation packing material inside in the hive to reduce the size of free air inside in the hive. And uh, the temperature then went back up to the, uh, the same sort of values that all the other bees had. So at least the bees weren't spending all their time trying to keep warm and they were able to move around um, to their honey source and things like that. So, you know, we would see it if it's a, a kind of a, a commercial version, if somebody in the US is handling 800 hives, you know, can they make 1,200 hives with the same resources because our monitors mean you don't have to open the hives as often. The same would happen um, with a hobbyist. You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, open the hives when you have to open them. Don't just keep opening because you're, you're worried about what's going on inside. And, um, We've kind of, from looking at our data, we realize that even if you open a hive and go through the frames, it takes quite a while for that hive to kind of settle back to a kind of a, a pattern that it had beforehand. So the more I do this, the kind of the more reluctant I am to opening hives and using a monitor to tell me, you know, where to go on it. Um, the other advantage, of course, is there's, there's other equipment out there that, for example, um, you know, will give you temperature and will give you um, humidity and things like that or weight. But in a lot of them, you've got to go and stand next to the hive to read it, um, or it's on a Bluetooth, which kind of reads a meter away, but you've then got to download it from that. With these ones here, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for me 
to phone up a beekeeper in the United States and say, oh, by the way, what's going on in that hive? Um, somebody's moving the roof. And they say, what do you mean? There should be nobody there today. So I can check on the, anybody's hives remotely from my laptop here in North Cork. Um, the other one is, of course, as I mentioned earlier, identifying outliers. And most of your hives in your apiary, if you're managing them fine, you know, will work away grand. Um, but it's useful to know early on, you know, if you're only inspecting your hives every month or something like that, if a hive starts to go downhill, you know, and you know a week into the trouble rather than a month into the trouble, you'll be able to save an awful lot more bees. Um, um, we, we also have alerts, you know, one is a movement alert. Um, I rang a guy in the States and said, um, you know, look, there's, a, there's something moving your hives. And he said, there's nobody there. And they went and had a look and it was a bear was taking the roof off the hives. Um, and uh, we, we've had cases here in Ireland where um, somebody, not with our monitors, but they kind of lamented the fact that they didn't have monitors. When somebody's hives were tipped over by animals that broke in from the field next door um, in snowy weather, and um, somebody went and put the hives back together again. Um, but of course, the beekeeper was driving by every day and thought the bees looked fine. But of course, all the bees had died with the cold. Whereas with our monitor, the minute the hive gets tipped over, you get sent an alert and you have some chance of rescuing them either from a downpour or, you know, from cold weather if your hive gets knocked over. Um, so then, you know, the other thing is, you know, you'll get, we, we can set how often you get your temperature readings for your graphs, you know, is it every hour, is it every two hours? And obviously the less frequent you do it, the longer the battery lasts. But as Fiona said, we're doing two years battery life under normal circumstances. And, you know, eventually over time by looking at temperature, humidity and sound, you begin to detect certain characteristics of what's going on in your hive. Um, we also, so as to be able to compare conditions inside with outside, you know, we, we provide you with weather data from your nearby weather station. Um, and, and that's important in telling, you know, whether you've got a weak hive and a strong hive, and I'll show you some graphs about that later on. Um, then we'll also, because, you know, some people don't look in, like looking at number, piles and piles of numbers or piles and piles of Excel tables or piles and piles of graphs, you know, we, we give you kind of simplified diagrams, um, which in general, you know, we try to make them um, using symbols rather than language, because we realize that not everybody has English as a first language. So we, we, we try to do it that way as well. Um, Real-time alerts then, um, you know, if there's a hive that's anomalous, some of the data doesn't look right or, you know, you have 15 hives and one of them doesn't have a, a line on the graph that's different, that has a line that's different from the others. You might say, well, I need to look in there. Now, what's important to say is that we are not going to diagnose the disease for you. What we do is we say that hive is different there's different sets of conditions, the different numbers of bees, things like that in that hive. Um, so we would say there's different conditions in that hive, but you, we rely on your skill as the beekeeper to identify, you know, whether it's a varroa problem, whether it's a starvation problem, whether it's queenlessness and things like that. Um, it's your skills rely on that. Um, Fiona says, you know, she uses an example, you know, where the stethoscope, but the doctor does have to look at the condition of the patient. Um, and then, um, you know, I mentioned movement earlier on. If, you know, in Ireland, you, you wouldn't be looking too much at high and low temperature alerts. But, you know, in places, you know, where it's very cold, uh, low temperature alerts can cause problems. And uh, we've seen in deserts where the temperature inside a hive can go up to 50 degrees and over. And then you begin to worry about wax melting. You know, you need to open your vents, increase the ventilation inside the hive. And you'll get that alert from us instead of, you know, being 50 miles away. And I mean, when I was in a place in South Africa, it was a six hour drive to the hives. Um, so knowing what's going on, you know, from your, your home in Johannesburg, as opposed to, you know, having to drive six hours to find out what's going on is extremely useful. And then um, we, we take the conditions that the manufacturers give us for mitocide treatments. Uh, you know, that there are certain temperature conditions and certain humidity treatments, certain humidity conditions. And we would look for those in your data and we would tell you, conditions are now suitable for the application of whatever. Um, you know, they're, they're mitocytes, but you know, there's also feed in some cases. Um, there's also, you know, you'll see in some countries antibiotics are allowed. And so whatever the conditions the manufacturer state, we'll give you a warning when the conditions are appropriate for that. And then, you know, you know the way we all keep information, some in notebooks, some in bits of paper, some in phones and things like that. Um, we have a way of recording the information. So for instance, I inspected the hive on this day. I added feed on this day. I added a queen on this day. Um, I split the hive on this day. You know, all that can be added on the computer and it all comes out 
uh, linked to that particular hive. Um, there's it, as I said there, it has the log that's involved as well. And then you can also give, get graphs of that kind of information. So it's a kind of a, a system that helps you, I, I suppose for the hobbyist, it, I think it gives you a bigger insight into what's going on in the hive. If you're interested in what the bees are doing, um, you learn more about it. Um, it's also, I think, labor saving uh, in that you kind of only observe or go into the hive when you need to. Um, but also I, I kind of think it's kinder to bees as well. Um, because, you know, if, you, if you're one of the people who smokes them well, you, you smoke the hive, you know, you're provoking the fire response in the bees. It's like, eek, you know, we fire coming down or whatever it is. And then they have to unload all the honey again. Whereas with the monitor, you don't even need to open the lid. That's not saying you never need to open the hives. You obviously will have to do inspections, but you'll reduce the number of inspections you do. Um, and you get more time to sit and watch your bees rather than fret about them. Yeah. Should I go on to the next slide? Sure. I'm trying to block you next time. There you go. <laughs> so sure, here's a, do you want to talk about this one and I'll talk about the next one or whatever? Sure, yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. this is the um, the first screen. So um, uh, once you've installed our monitors in your beehive and they're up and running, they're sending data back to, to the servers, you're able to log into our web console. So this is a website that you log into and that's where you actually access the, the data and the sensor, or the sensor data and the insights from your beehives. And one thing that we put a lot of work into, so through our, our machine learning and through our data science team um, is uh, being able to pull out and identify the beehives that are behaving differently. So that's the, the primary thing that we do um, for, for beekeepers in Ireland is we say, um, here's the outliers. So by outliers, we mean these are the beehives that are behaving outside of the kind of normal beehive behavior that we see. Um, so here in this experimental apiary with 15 beehives, you can see there's three beehives that are, are, have weird temperature behavior, one beehive with weird humidity behavior, and two beehives with weird sound behavior. And so some of these, like it might be, some of these might be the same with beehive that has both temperature and humidity odd behavior. But basically, instead of inspecting, this is exactly what Porter was talking about earlier, if you want to go out to the yard, then we would recommend that you open these beehives that have been highlighted and that you don't open the other beehives. So first of all, it doesn't look like those beehives need to be opened. They are behaving the same as each other, they're behaving consistently, they're not behaving um, unusually right now. Um, so you're probably likely to uh, probably cause more problems than you'll solve by <laughs> opening them right now. Um, as that, what that means is that you either can spend less time at your yard if that's what you'd like to do, or you can spend more time working on the beehives that have been behaving differently. So you've got more time to try and identify, is there a problem? Um, is there something that I need to do here um, in order to get these guys back into the normal behavior? Uh, so for example, so if, I, if I could jump in there, for instance, you know, the, the first thing it gives you is total there, because you know, if you have four, three or four apiaries and you've got, let's say three apiaries, and you have 15 hives in each apiary, well, under the top total, you're gonna to get a number 45 there. Um, and it'll give you the overall one. And then under experimental apiary there, you, you'll get your other two apiaries under that as well, and they'll be in detail. But when I see a humidity outlier in my hives at this time of the year, the first thing I think about is that I've got a wet roof. Um, now, if it, if it happens to be at a time when there's a honey flow on, you know, um, if, Nine out of 10 hives have all got a high humidity. I'm saying, right, they're fanning um, to reduce the humidity. I've got one outlier which doesn't, isn't fanning. Then I'm saying there's something wrong in that hive because every other one has a honey flow and these ones don't. So I, that's looking at it at the very general level. And then you've got other information down on the left-hand side, um, which talks about the kind of reports that you can present and the reports that you can compile. There's an online user manual there as well. Um, so if you move to the next one, maybe. Yeah. So here um, you'll see this is a, a Napier in the United States. And here you've got a kind of across the top, you've got your local weather conditions, you know, at the time that the, you, you turn on your laptop and you, you have a thing called an apiary chart. You know, if you move down to the second line where you've got the horizontal orange bars, it says apiary chart. And that will give you kind of an overview of all the hives uh, with temperature, humidity, um, sound. Um, and then you can get the, the weather for that local apiary over a longer period of time if you look at the apiary weather chart. Um, 
Then you have, you know, number ascending or number descending. You can have your, every, every one of your monitors will have a number. So do you want them in ascending or descending order? Um, then under the other column, you, you can ask for um, other elements of sorting. But if you look there, you can see the number 540 on your top left-hand side. You can see there that there's a little white beehive in an orange square. And the little white beehive um, standing upright like that means that it hasn't, the roof of that hive has not been moved or the hive hasn't been bumped um, since you last inspected it and reset it. On the other hand, if you come down to the row below, you'll see that there are two in the middle that have actually got the little hive lying on its side, which means that it's been bumped um, or the roof has been lifted in that particular time. Um, so that would have been, alert would have been sent to you and that's recorded there. So um, you then have, it's not shown on this, but if you have a white colored hive, it means the hive is in okay condition. If you have a black colored hive, it means the hive is dead or what in the US they call it dead out. Um, and if it's a hive that's gray, it means that the machine learning hasn't made up its mind um, as to exactly what the condition of that hive is. But that's one you're definitely going to look at because you'd rather over inspect the hive and make sure it's okay than ignore something that maybe is an amber warning light rather than a red light. Um, so you can look at that and then you get a battery level indicator. Um, and um, we then provide other information on the little plus symbol uh, in terms of interpreting the data further. Okay. So, so here's, a, here's a typical sort of screenshot of what you get. And um, you can see again on the top, top red bar, you have your apiary chart and your weather chart. And then underneath that, you have uh, where well, you can see it says temperature and there's a drop down arrow. Um, that drop down arrow can lead you to temperature, to humidity or to sound. And um, so you can select any of those. And underneath that, you can see the num hive numbers 540, 543 and 544, they're highlighted. So the person looking at this data would have selected those three hives to compare with each other. And then where it says temperature, you move to the right, you have a start date and a start time. When do you want to start your your examination of the data and when you want to finish it. And then you hit search and it'll produce a graph like this. So the graph has got four colors on it there. Uh, three of them are hives uh, monitors and the red one is the external temperature in, that, in the general area of that apiary. For instance, the nearest one to me is about 30 kilometers away uh, from the temperature to that. So, um, if you look at those traces there on the graph, you look at the red one on the bottom, and, and this is in the southern United States, and what you have is you can see the red line is lowest down, that's the external temperature, and where you see the peaks, that's kind of early afternoon, late afternoon, and where you see the dips, they're nights. So you can see the red line dipping regularly, which is the nighttime temperature. Now if you also look carefully at the graph, and you look at the green trace, the green line, you can see the green line temperature tends to be lower than the other ones because you have the orange and the blue above it all the time. And then as you, you're over on the left-hand side, you can see that the hive at night is warmer than the external environment. But as, those, as that period, as the dates move forward, you can eventually see there are some nights when the green line and the red line are overlapping, which means the temperature of that hive inside where the monitor is, is the same temperature as outside. And that would suggest to you that that hive is not able to keep itself warm during the night in the same way, for instance, that the blue line would be. If you go over towards the right, you can see the blue dotted line is well above the red dotted line. So the blue hive is keeping itself warmer at night than the, um, than the green line, which is kind of overlapping very closely with the red line. So if that was me now, I'd go into that hive and say, why is that hive cold? Is it because there's too few bees? Is it because it's too drafty? Is it because I have the Varroa board out in the middle of the winter and there's a breeze blowing up it? Is it because the site is too, it's not that the site is too windy because obviously some hives are able to keep warm, but that'll give you information. And that's the kind of information I used to kind of shrink the air volume inside in the colony that, that was weak um, because of the fact that hive just couldn't keep itself warm. And then, you know, if it's too cold, well, the queen isn't gonna start laying. If she does start laying, you're gonna start losing brood and there's not enough bees to keep the brood warm. It's a kind of a vicious circle. So looking at that, the only hive I'd, I'd inspect of that lot is the, um, the one with the green trace, which is uh, 544. Um, I'd be, be happy enough with the other ones. Um, can you go on to the next one, please, Fiona? 
And then you can add other things. So if you look under the red bar, experimental apiary, there says temperature, then there's the dates. And then you can see sunrise, sunset. By clicking that arrow, it'll tell you when sunrise and sunset is in whatever part of the world you happen to be. So with, this would have been adjusted for Florida. Um, so what you have here is you can see, you know, that late afternoon coming up to sunset, the hives are warmest and they're coldest at night. And, you know, um, by looking at that, um, you even then when you start looking at sound, you'll see when the bees get noisier, you know, in the morning before they go out, sometimes they don't even wait until sunrise to start getting worked up. You can hear the noise kind of going up in the hives before sunrise. Um, and then when the bees stop foraging in the evening, you know, there's more bees inside in the hive, they get noisy, then they get quieter again. So you can, you can learn an awful lot about your hives by knowing kind of the time of the day, um, what the conditions are inside in the hive. And, and overall, you know, I, I think it gives great satisfaction to, to working with bees and, you know, it, it allows you to do better use of your resources and, um, you know, mm -hmm. does not interrupt the bees unless they really need to be interrupted, I feel. Do you have more to add? Yeah, to maybe something. Yeah, just one more thing to add. And um, so you see the way that we've oh, got yeah. the sunrise and sunset markers there. You can actually add an event. So uh, right. if you want to, um, yeah, exactly, add your notes about your beekeeping so that you can kind of use that information to help you interpret the data you can. So you could add an event, things like if you fed or if you, you know, added a new um, super or something or removed a super, obviously all of those kind of changes are going to produce a sudden change in the data that the sensor is seeing. And um, so you're able to put a little marker and say, look, I added a new super that day. So the next time you come back and look at that sensor's uh, data, you don't go, oh, oh God, the bees are all dead or <laughs> something very, very crazy is happening there. You're able to make a note and then it's able to, it, it's great then as well as a kind of a reference tool. Uh, if you want to go back and be like, oh, when did I add that super? You have to say, look, here's my data, there's the note. <laughs> and what it does, what it does also, it, it doesn't add the, I mean, it'll write out the event underneath the graph as a separate, say half page. But what it actually does is it puts a bar on the graph in the same way that the sunrise sunset. So you can look at exactly, look at the data and, uh, you know, I mean, we, we had one where there was a hurricane, you know, and, uh, you know, six months later, you're trying to remember when was the time of the hurricane and you look at the graph and you can see that in the case of the hurricane that we were looking at, you know, the up, down, day and night temperature changes just didn't happen for the four days of the hurricane. The temperatures were completely straight and you look at it and you look at your bar on your graph and it says hurricane, you said, aha, that's when it happened. Um, so you can actually mark the event on the graphs themselves. Um, so that helps you track, you know, you'll do something and you'll be going, when exactly did I do that? Because that hive changed. And then you look at it and it'll tell you that. So yeah, it's, sorry, Fiona, I forgot that. No, it's okay. Just between the two of us will remember everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I saw, we've already got one question about where, where can you buy them? <laughs> so if you're interested in uh, buying a device, so it's actually, they're available for pre-order right now on our website. So you can go onto our website, which is www.apisprotect.com. And uh, there's a little shop in the top right-hand corner. If you're based in Ireland, um, you can buy a monitor there, you can pre-order a monitor there for delivery. Um, uh, slightly later in the season, we don't have a confirmed delivery date yet. Uh, we're still working with our manufacturers. Uh, but there is actually, uh, unfortunately, uh, we've got a limited number of them available at this point. We, we've uh, put a limit on the number that we're able to manufacture this year. And um, uh, well, luckily for us, <laughs> um, they're actually almost sold out. So there's, uh, there, are, there are a good few left, but uh, not uh, about 10%, I'd say, of what we started out with that are left. Um, so if you're interested, get on the shop sooner rather than later, so avoid disappointment. Um, and if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us, uh, start off with our website. There's lots more information about what we do, um, a lot of videos about us explaining all the things we've been explaining today. Um, you can sign up to our newsletter there. Uh, so we send out a monthly newsletter. Oh, great. That's great to hear, Aiden. Thanks. <laughs> Aiden has pre-ordered. Um, so um, our monthly newsletter contains information. So uh, we learn an awful lot about beekeeping all around the world when it's not, when we're not locked down due to COVID-19. We go on interesting adventures to beekeepers all around the world. So uh, I think it's, well, it's a great newsletter to keep up with us for sure. And I think it's also an interesting just general beekeeping newsletter too. And then finally, this weekend on uh, the BBC World News Channel, uh, we're being featured in um, their show called Follow the Food. So there's some footage there of our devices in action. 
uh, some nice films by the BBC, so it all looks very pretty, and also um, some videos of me with my COVID-19 hair talking about what we did. And um, so that was from films filmed in October last year, I think. Um, so uh, tune in if you're interested to, to learn a little bit more. Uh, we talk a good bit more there actually about the, the Polynesian industry too, which is what, what the, the lads at the BBC were particularly interested in. Um, so I guess before we go on to questions, Stephen, I don't know if you want to come on and moderate that or do you want us to just... Yeah, guys, get your questions, questions in now and get in on, on chat. Um, I'm just going to give them a two minutes to compile them. I'm going to take advantage and ask you two questions myself. First of all, fantastic <laughs> stuff. You guys talked, uh, Fiona, you talked in Galway like three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And the sophistication of the yeah. device is, is, is very impressive. Um, now, Thank first you. question. So you have you have the sensors in the in the guys going to the pollination in, in um, the almonds, yeah, in America. Yeah. Have you yeah. noticed any trends that like in the data, does the data give any indication that the almonds are damaging to the bees or is there any indication the data of something like that? Ooh, good one. And um, Podrick, uh, do you want to talk first on that? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, obviously, one, one of the things that, you know, if you want to find out what damage, you need a kind of a before and after scenario. Um, um, but one, one of the, the particular concerns about almonds is one that, you know, people do use even carefully, they, they use pesticides on almonds because there's several, um, you know, fungi and insect pests that, that attack the almonds. And, and, you know, obviously, the, the good growers, you know, will, will, apply the insecticides at night or, you know, at times when the almonds are not flowering. But one of the other concerns is the way I put it is, you know, and you can say this in Ireland, you know, if, if, if you eat nothing but sliced pans all your life, you won't be very healthy. Um, or even if you spend a month eating sliced pans, you won't be very healthy. And if you um, don't have a varied pollen diet in bees, their, their immune system isn't as good at tackling things like pesticides or things like tackling other diseases. So there's a real push on at the moment in several beekeeping organizations in the United States to increase the diversity of planting around the um, almond orchards and planting in general. So for example, even in the first year that we went to almonds, there wasn't much floral diversity around the almonds and it's just miles and miles of almond flowers and the almond flowers open on St. Valentine's Day, give or take a day or two. And before that, there's nothing for the bees except sugar syrup. And after that, there's nothing for the bees except sugar syrup. The almonds come into bloom. The only thing they feed on is almonds. And you know, generally it's recognized that that kind of a diet is not good for bee immunity and for bee resistance and general bee health. Um, so, so that's one of the concerns, but I, I suppose we weren't in kind of a, in a period when almonds were worked any other way. Um, mm -hmm. and, and certainly yeah. the, the bees are in almonds for such a short period. I mean, they're in on the 14th of February and a lot of them are already kind of getting ready to be removed. Um, so changes wouldn't happen that quickly, um, you know, in, inside in bees. But certainly, I mean, we, we can see that when the almonds um, start flowering and the number of frames of bees start going up in the hive, our monitors can tell us, you know, there's, there's more bees in this hive, there's more brood in this hive. Um, yeah. Or in, in some cases, it's going down, yeah. Yeah, um, maybe, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, just one other thing that, that came to mind uh, with that question as well. Um, I think what we've seen, and it's kind of, it's, it's a way they kind of recognize thing, is that the, the transporting of beehives to and from almonds oh, yeah. is, is quite stressful on the bees themselves. Um, you know, obviously uh, loading, uh, so the way that it works is you get a truck full of bees, which is 400 hives on the back of a, you know, a normal, an 18 wheeler, as they call it over in the US. Um, and they could be transported, literally transported from every corner of the US. So you've got, uh, you know, beehives going over and back from the East Coast. So um, I don't know how many thousands of miles as those beehives travel, um, you know, traveling along the motorway at 120 kilometers an hour. Um, the outside bees get quite chilled or the, the boxes on the outside get very cold. The boxes on the inside get quite warm. And you do see a lot of, um, if a beehive isn't quite strong going into that in the first place, uh, you know, it, it, it can cause serious damage. Um, so one thing that we're, very excited to help beekeepers do in the US because they really like that is um, getting your beehives out to almonds is by far the most stressful point in the year for, for these beekeepers. They're trying to do it as fast as possible. They don't have time to stop and check that every single beehive is healthy enough to make it up onto the truck. So they're just putting anything that isn't obviously dead gets put on the truck and there is uh, significant losses. Um, so we're very excited to be able to give them just an instantaneous look. Here's your list of beehives you put on the truck. Here's a list of beehives you don't put on the truck. It takes two seconds to separate them out. And it, it also works, it works also in terms of, I mean, 
you know, to send a truck from the East Coast to the US to the West Coast one way is about $17,000. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a return trip is another $17,000. Now, if you can separate out dead or weak hives from live hives, it's the difference between sending four trucks and sending three trucks. You can send three trucks of strong hives or four trucks of a mix, you know, and you're already saving $34,000 on the transport alone doing it that way. And um, you get you get a higher premium for the strong hives. So, so you're, you're kind of winning. Are you able to then, are the sensors able to sell the stronger hives better to the to the pollinate, to the guys for the contracts to say, oh, this hive is stronger because the data says it's stronger? Yeah, that, that a that's a really good question. Sorry, I'll just turn off the screen sharing so we can, we can see, see ourselves a bit better. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's um, one very strong tenant that we have at Apis Protect is that the, the privacy and the data of these beekeepers is, is very important. So we never share beekeeper data with anyone. We never share beekeeper data with other beekeepers and we don't share beekeeper data with customers. So for those guys, for those almond guys, uh, we don't share data with those almond growers. You know, that could be very, it could be very good or very bad for the beekeeper saying, oh, look, these bees yeah. are worse than you thought they were, or these bees are better than you thought they were. But we do give those beekeepers the reports and they could be very, like, especially if your beekeeper puts a lot of effort into making sure you have very good, very strong, very high quality hives, uh, that would be a very useful thing for a uh, pollination contract negotiation. Uh, but we do leave that up to the beekeepers themselves. That, that's something we, um, we're kind of aware of the value of this data and the potential um, value of this data to other people in the food chain besides beekeepers. And um, so we want to make sure we don't accidentally cause damage to the beekeepers themselves with our own data. Mad, okay, that's really interesting. Um, okay, you guys obviously are very, very familiar with big data. I had touched on it years ago myself. Um, what, if anything, have you found really interesting that you didn't expect to come out of the data? That's a really good question. Um, I think for me, the thing that surprised me the most from day one, even during during my PhD, uh, and I, I guess this is maybe even less a B thing, but just how powerful the machine learning was. I ran my very first algorithm and it was able to detect, uh, I think it was detecting dead and alive beehives with like 96% accuracy. And I was like, I did spend a, like a solid week after I did that the first time, I spent a week trying to work out how I'd done it wrong and accidentally gotten to such a good result. <laughs> so just how how good the machine learning is at picking out these patterns and at identifying these patterns and sorting these beehives into, you know, this is okay, this is a concern, this is the one you need to look at. And that that was just insane. Um, but you know, good, obviously. Um, and then thinking about like actual okay. data. I, I, I think it's I, what, what I was, you know, again, it's to do with the accuracy of the thing, but, um, you know, when, you know, I would be inspecting hundreds of hives, like I'd spend, I don't know, was it 2019, I spent six weeks out in the States and every day, seven o'clock in the morning, going through hives until seven o'clock in the evening, um, seven days a week. And so you get through hundreds of hives doing that. And, and I would say, you know, this fry, this hive has seven frames of bees you know, two frames of brood, so many frames of honey. And you, you, you feed that into the machine learning and you do it over several weeks in the same sets of hives or whatever it is. And, and then in the end, you know, you kind of look at the machine learning and you say, well, what do I expect? You know, what does that hive tell me? What does the machine turn, what does the machine learning tell me about that hive? And how does that compare with what I've found in that hive? And, you know, if I say seven frames of bees, nine times out of 10, it is seven frames of bees that the machine learning has worked out. And I'm going, I don't believe this, you know, how, how can it be this way? And then yeah. the other one is when you say there's a, a change in the number of frames of bees from five frames to six frames, you think, bah, you know, you can never tell that, you know, and you look at it, yes, you can. By temperature or something, isn't it? Yeah. It's, there's lots of things, it's there's temperature, humidity, sound. Yeah, and it uses all three of those sensors together. Um, yeah, so that's the, the unfortunate thing about machine learning. We do get asked a lot, like, you know, how does it know this? And it's like, the way that machine learning works is it, it goes, oh, we push all this data into a black box, into a, you know, a computer, and the computer does its thing. And it's not able to come back and explain how it knows that, it just does know it. It's kind of like one of the, 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 the best analogies around machine learning is uh, when you're teaching a machine learning algorithm how to identify a cat and identify a dog. So yeah. how do you know if I showed you a picture of a cat, 
how do you know that's a cat? You can't say it has fur, so it's a cat because dogs have fur. You can't say it has pointy ears because some dogs have pointy ears, has a tail, some dogs have tails, some dogs don't have tails. But yet we never ever mix up a cat and a dog. I mean, I, or I've never mixed up a cat and a dog. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like, it's sort of, it just knows and it can't really explain why in the same way you can't explain how you always know what a cat is. <laughs> yeah. um, Another really interesting uh, thing that came out of the sensor data um, that unfortunately it's on the kind of the, the less happy side, it's identifying what went wrong after um, several beehives have died. So we had one operation where um, they were um, very worried that there had been a pesticide um, kind of exposure and that it had led to their beehives dying. And we were comparing sites where we had large diets of bees and we were able to see uh, look, after a pesticide exposure, you have this really short window where you've got a lot of beehives dropping off very, very quickly. Whereas, uh, you know, uh, death due to another reason, so something like starvation or some other problems, it's going to be a much slower decline over a longer period. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's not as not as fun as helping save and identify problems in advance, but still very valuable, um, you know, kind of doing basically a post-mortem on what, what's happened here. Yeah. I think the okay. other one, well, sorry. No, go, no, go ahead, Patrick. No, no, the, the other one is, I, I, I suppose, you know, you, the, the ability to see how long it takes hives to get over an inspection. Um, mm. You know, I mean, you know, we, we go, we, we, you know, smoke or not smoke, take the roof off, you know, go through the frames, put it back together again. And you think, grand, if those bees are going to calm down. You know, you could be looking at 12 to 24 hours before those patterns reestablish themselves again in some hives. And I'm going, you know, when you're thinking about honey gathering or, you know, when you think about the general behavior in the hive, queen laying, how much of that are you upsetting, you know, by going through an inspection process? And you, you really, when you put the lid on the hive, you don't know what's happening after that. But when you look at the monitor, um, we used to have a CO2 monitor in, in original models, and that used to show us very well. Um, exactly how, inter how in invasive uh, an inspection procedure was. Um, that actually to touches on a point. So I came across this stuff, uh, I think it's fringe, but there's an idea that the cluster in winter has something called a carbon dioxide shield. So that kind of insulates the bees. Is that mm -hmm. something you were able to see? Is like, is, do you have any information on that? Because I never saw any science on it. It was just a fringe idea. Did that ever come up on your data? Well, um, yeah, I, I've never heard of, of CO2 shielding, but definitely what we saw in overwintering beehives is, um, you know, it, when it's closed up, when the bees are all clumped together as much as possible, you do see the CO2 levels go way higher. That was one of the, the first things um, pretty early on. Um, we were trying to get purchase our CO2 sensors to go into the device. And from my PhD, I knew that we had like it, it saturated my CO2 sensor, which means the CO2 levels went higher than my CO2 sensor can detect. Yeah. And um, we were searching for a CO2 sensor to put into our device. And I was like, I, I need a CO2 sensor that can go up to, you know, 10, 15,000 parts per million, which is a very high CO2 concentration. Like that's higher than, uh, I don't know if humans would definitely die, but we'd get pretty oh, easily. Easily. Yeah. 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 They would die in it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so that's, I, I can't do the maths in my head. I'm not going to try. <laughs> and what kind of percentage of CO2 that is? And people were like, why do you what need a CO2 sensor that can measure that? <laughs> Yeah, so, so what was your goal for the CO2 sensor, just to see or? Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, um, what we were looking for was sensors where the patterns reflected the changing in the behavior of the beehives and the CO2 sensor does uh, reflect it really dramatically. And because it's going between, you know, normal ambient CO2, which is 300 parts per million, all the way up to 10,000. When you as a human are looking at the, the uh, sensor data coming out of the beehive, the CO2 is one where you can really quickly see, okay, they, they've, they've clustered up there, they're, they've shut things down, they're all inside the beehive, the CO2 has gone way up, and then they've all left, it goes way down. And so when we were kind of visually interpreting the data, the CO2 sensor was very important. Uh, but then um, first of all, the CO2 sensor is very expensive because obviously we're using a very specialized CO2 sensor yeah. that was, um, it was half of the price of this entire device or CO2 yeah. sensor was, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is a lot. And it, this would be a lot more expensive if it had a CO2 sensor in it. Um, and um, so we wanted to get rid of it for that reason, uh, because we wanted to provide it at a low price if possible. And then secondly, it also used more than half of the battery of the device as well, because they're very power hungry sensors. Um, so we put a lot of work into collecting temperature, humidity, sound data, accelerometer data, because those are all, um, you know, really, really accurate, which is mass produced sensors that you can get very, very high quality temperature, humidity microphones um, for a low price. 
and we got enough data from those sensors uh, in, in order to be able to get our machine learning equally accurate without the CO2 sensor. Um, so that was a huge project in 2019, 20, early 2020 that we had. And luckily we got there. So no CO2 sensor anymore. Interesting, interesting. Because like the, the idea that they were trying to promote at the time was that CO2, I'm going to get this wrong, CO2 is a better insulator for infrared heat or bounces it back. And the bees create this kind of shield or insulation buffer. And then like the question was about like um, Varroa floors, that if you have turbulence underneath, it's going to affect yep. this CO2 shield. You wouldn't have that in a tree cavity because it's usually enclosed. So yep. you have basically a, an envelope of CO2 and that's keeping them warm and it's just not visible. So we don't think about it. But then if you have a Varroa floor and there's breezes going through it, are you damaging that? And that's what's chilling them or... Obviously, it's it's not studied yet, so it's hard to hard to say. There's a question here you might be able to answer better than me. Uh, Mary is asking, why does the CO2 not kill the bees? That was really like when when I first started getting that data during my PhD. Again, I was like, my CO2 sensors are broken. Um, you know, that's the only explanation for this. The CO2 sensors are broken, so we took them back, calibrated them. They were they were accurate, and uh, I went back into really really old papers, and I found some experiments that someone did back in like the 70s where they were like pouring CO2 into beehives for whatever, uh, I don't know why they decided to do it, but luckily they'd recorded what they did. Um, the honeybees don't experience the medical term. I used to know that when I was defending my PhD, I knew this off the top of my head. <laughs> Hypoxia, is that the word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yeah. Which is basically what happens to us and other uh, mammals and probably other insects as well yeah. when we get a very high CO2 concentration. It's probably, a, a response I imagine that they developed because they live in those very very high CO2 environments. In trees. Yeah, but you need, yeah. to, need to keep the temperature stable throughout the, throughout yeah. the winter. So exactly. they developed that, that sympathy. Yeah, in order to keep the bee, the hive at the temperature they need to survive the winter, there's no escaping the, the level of CO2 that's going to build up there. So I think it's it's a they've developed this uh, really, really good um, immunity to, to high CO2 concentrations, yeah. I guess. Yeah. It's probably it's probably an evolutionary kind of thing that, mm -hmm. you know, if the first thing you do is you evolve to, to shelter inside in trees, okay, well, trees are going to, or it's, it's a hole in the tree, therefore the CO2 level is going to be higher. And if you can't survive those conditions, well, you, you die. Anyway. Yeah. You died anyway. So they, they have to adapt. And those who can tolerate higher CO2 levels survive and breed and let their genes further on to the next population. Yeah. And, you know, their ability to tolerate CO2 is, is kind of their survival. But one of the things we saw, which was of interesting as well, was that, um, for which we still don't know, was that sometimes we would get spikes in CO2 in the hive for no apparent reason at all. Um, you know, you'd be dealing with, you know, maybe 2,500 parts per million CO2. And all of a sudden, for the space of a few hours, it would go up to 15, 16, 20,000 parts per million. And then it would drop down again. And we still don't know what's going on. Um, and we, we had other cases where, um, you know, somebody did an inspection in the hive. And in some cases, there'd be no CO2 peak. And in other cases, there would be a CO2 peak. Um, uh, so C CO CO2 is a, is a mystery and you know I mean obviously if CO2 is a greenhouse gas that suggests that it's a blanket for keeping the heat in um, yeah. so why wouldn't it apply in a tree or why wouldn't it apply in a hive um, but I certainly whereas before I used to be saying oh I must make sure that my bees get plenty of air going in under the varroa board um, you know obviously I want to control the varroa um, but obviously, I don't want my bees to suffocate. Well, having done Apis Protect work and seen the levels of CO2, I keep my varroa board well closed um, during yeah. the winter. And they can breathe through the entrance, then that's the end of it, you know? Um, yeah. And there's some, um, so, so they, they can tolerate enormous levels of CO2. And, uh, you know, I don't worry too much. I mean, I'd be more worried about dampness now than kind of air exchange for the bees, you know? Um. Last question before, uh, just, sorry, I'll just, there's a comment here uh, from Michael Kavanagh. He says, wow, how brilliant. He's blown away by your presentation. It's Michael and Waterford. Um, Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. Thanks so much. This is a commercial business. So this question, I'm understanding if you can't answer it, but what's the future for you guys? Oh, that, 
that's fine. Nope, happy to answer that one. So uh, right now we're working on, so we've got our commercial technology in the US, we've got our hobbyist technology in Ireland. Uh, so our first objective is to make Irish beekeepers the most technically advanced beekeepers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> releasing all of our devices here and uh, then we want to bring our te hobbyist technologies to more markets so um to, to more uh, european countries as well as uh eventually the us too i did see a question earlier somebody who will be categorized as a hobbyist in the us yes right now unfortunately our technology isn't available um for that kind of setup um it's just a case of uh, the hobbyist technology is our newer technology so we've limited ourselves to beekeepers where our team, so our R&D team is based in Cork and our sales team is based in the US. So we want to keep our, our newer devices and our, our, our new product close to our R&D guys who um, are available to help if you know people have questions and stuff like that. Fantastic. Oh, and, and sorry. Yeah, so scaling up, that's get this technology out to as many beehives as possible, help as many beehives, help as many beekeepers as possible. Is our there's a, there's um, 91 million beehives in the world. Uh, we're not going to get all of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll aim for 90. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys, I think uh, if there's any more questions, yeah, it's just uh, Mary Watch saying thank you for a brilliant talk. Um, thank thank you all of you. Questions there. But this was very, very interesting, guys. Uh, thank you very much for giving us your time, and I really hope you the best with the, with the product in the future. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks so much. Um, um, if you if you sign up with our newsletter, um, there's a there's a particularly interesting link that we put up there today, which is on this whole pollination industry in the United States. There's a, a short video which shows you know right from the time that all the bees are taken out of they call them yards, their apiaries at night, put on trucks driven across the U.S. The way they're inspected going into California, the way they go to almonds, the way they're taken off almonds. It's a it's a short video, but it's really enlightening to show you the scale of the thing that is just gobsmacking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. as an industry exactly and just one more i see one more question just popped up here for me um what kind of hides are needed for our technology um in in ireland um so any not not any kind of beehive i mean like we've worked with um, national beehives we work with commercial we work with langstroth beehives uh we do have a couple of customers with um the polystyrene hives that are kind of similar in their layout to those kind of you know those up and down beehives or you've got the brood box and you've got the, the supers on top. Um, the technology works the same in all of those as long as it fits into the space that's available. Uh, we have had a couple of people approach us with um, top bar beehives, uh, which top is- Top bar uh, hives and, lay and lay -ins hives, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So those are setups that we haven't tested. Um, the most important thing is to make sure that the air is flowing up from the colony to the sensors themselves. Um, so basically, we've seen some top air hives where there's no air, air exchange at all. So I don't think it would be suitable there, but there's some of them where there are gaps. So you know, make sure that there's airflow from the colony to our sensors, uh, basically, regardless of what kind of setup of hive you have, as long as you've got airflow, our sensors should work fine. Yeah, in Spain, they have been, in Spain, they, they have seen advertised two kinds of lay ins hives, one of which the top bars are kind of even sided and, and so close together, no air goes into the roof space. And then mm -hmm. other ones, um, you know, if you turn a Hoffman on its side, so it's kind of wasted. So your, your, your top bars, you know, are kind of wide at the ends where they sit on the, the hive itself. And then they get narrower as they come towards the center over the brood area. But in those cases, the air would be able to travel up. So we reckon they would work on, on those kind of lay-ins hives um, and those kind of frames. But um, we, we, we haven't tried them in those yet, but there's no reason why, as long as the air gets into the roof, um, you know, they should work. They screw onto the underside of the roof. I've, I've got them in my hives. I've put them in commercials. I've put them in nationals. We've put them in Langstroths. And, um, you know, it takes me with a screwdriver, it takes me under a minute to put them in. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's not even as difficult as the Ikea, you know, it's just two screws and, and a screwdriver. It goes in and we do all the rest. Um, you're, you're giving me a question there, if you can answer this, it might be controversial. Do you see anything in the data that suggests that treatments have any effect on the status of the bees? Ooh, that's, that's a good one. I'd say it's true. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we certainly, I mean, we certainly had hives, you know, in the US that we've seen treated with formic acid, um, you know, and the, um, you know, the monitor doesn't collapse under those ones. And we, we haven't noticed anything particularly severe with in, in those particular yeah. cases. But but I would say, you know, I'd, I'd, we'd like to do more on that. 
um, before we get in. That we certainly haven't seen anything, you know, dramatic um, yeah. in terms of pesticide applications yet. Yeah, we've seen uh, basically, I think that the probably most dramatic situation we've seen is where uh, people have treated uh, because they're just kind of doing a blanket treatment and weren't taking a lot of um, notice of what, what was going on. A very, very weak colony already that was then treated and uh, then like it pushed it further over the edge. We could say it was probably on the way out anyway. So that's probably the biggest event we've had so far. You need more data, basically. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Is there a lot of questions like that? That's the same answer. Um, I would say and not too much. I mean, I guess basically one of those things that the more we learn, the more questions we have. Basically, you know, yep. the more the more we understand the stuff, that the, the the better we get at answering the questions we already have. But once we answer them, we get new ones. So, um, you know, we've got other questions like uh, people are really excited for us to to try and detect things like queenlessness, and um, you know, we often get the question, oh, are you going to be able to measure uh, varroa levels and like queenlessness is uh, yeah eventually once we get enough data varroa levels then is kind of but that's a more difficult question to solve it's kind of a Swarm, we don't, swarming yeah swarming is another one we get swarming is another one yeah that's so the right piping now, you can you can detect that uh, yeah, well, I did a bit of work on that uh, earlier. Um, so a little bit of APIS Project and, and a good bit of my PhD. Um, right now, we don't listen out for piping. What we do is we're basically monitoring, you know, if your colony is really big, it's again really warm during the summer and it's, you know, it looks like a really big colony, then it's basically like a, this is one is in the danger zone. If it's a nice day and the hive is jammed, packed full of bees, that's the one that you should be watching out for swarming. We don't detect swarming right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question here. Does the device interfere with the bees at all? Yeah, that's actually, I should have brought that one up myself. That, that's a question we get an awful lot about the, I presume we're talking there about the, the radio within our device, the, the, the transmitter that sends the data back to us. And um, no, is the answer. So first of all, uh, we've, I, I'm like, I'm on year number nine now of monitoring bees, I think. Eight, eight definitely, maybe nine of monitoring bees. Uh, have never, in all the beehives that we've ever monitored, have we ever noticed a difference between the hives that we're monitoring and the other hives in the apiary? So we always have other beehives that are not instrumented with our devices. So beehives that are behaving perfectly normally and beehives that are monitored. There's never been a, a, a difference in performance between those two sets of bees. And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of evidence, a lot of, I guess, yeah. anecdotal evidence. And then secondly, uh, there is a lot of research out there at the moment into the effect of ORF transmitters on beehives. And basically the, the, the conclusion is there's not really a lot of evidence that there is damage to beehives from ORF signals, uh, but the kind of general guidance is there should not be more than, they shouldn't be exposed to the radio waves for more than two hours a day. The way that we transmit our data, our radio only turns on for a couple of seconds once every few hours. Um, so it's actually, we uh, are limiting ourselves to a quarter of that. So we don't use our radio for more than half an hour a day, if you get what I mean. So it's that saves your battery. Seconds. Seconds. It does. It saves our battery. It means that our bees are definitely safe. Everybody wins. So it's like you're sending a text message once an hour. It's whatever the frequency of the, the guy set it up as, yeah? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So basically, uh, I'm quite confident that our device inside the beehive doesn't isn't exposing your beehives to any more radio interference than they get from just literally sitting Thanks. in the countryside where there are mobile antennas, people driving past in their cars with their phone on and stuff like that, which they shouldn't be doing, but they definitely do. <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, guys, that's, I think that's us for tonight. That was fantastic. Uh, thank you again for giving us your time and talking about your work. Um, everybody, thank you. I, I suppose I speak for everybody for to say thank you for, for your time and uh, have a great night. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks so much for having us. Hi to anybody nope. who knows me in the IBA. Hi. And hi to any of our test beekeepers who might be here. Thank you so much <laughs> if you're here. And obviously, you know, we're, we're keen to, you know, for anybody that does install monitors, if you do get something yeah. weird, we're, we're particularly interested because obviously your data is confidential to us, but we might be getting the same weird message from half a dozen other beekeepers <laughs> in your region that we can't tell you about, but we can say, oh yeah, maybe here there's something going on here that merits further study. Um, but, uh, you know, we will, you know, maintain your privacy and, and all that kind of thing. But, you know, almost every time you look at the data, you can find something new. So please keep going. Thanks. Great. Thanks guys. All the best. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thanks.